Let's get into the history of GBTC then. Yeah. So GBTC was like the first way you could get access on the traditional financial rails, right? I think it, I don't even, 2015 is when it launched. I think that's about right. So it, it launched as what, it, it basically launched as a hedge fund. So it right, the only way to get access still, even if you wanted to create shares back when it was open for creations, was a private placement, which basically it's like a PE fund, hedge fund. It's a private vehicle. You have to be an accredited investor or qualified purchaser to create shares, to buy in, just like a hedge fund. So an AI, accredited, we call them AIQP. Um, AI, you have to have like a million investable assets outside of your home. QP is 5 million or make $200,000 for the past two years. But those have been the rules for like ever and they haven't changed with inflation, which is good in my opinion. I think some of the AI QP rules are, are dumb because they don't let people get access to certain things. But Yeah, I mean, they seem to be arbitrarily unfair. Yes. Yeah. It was like, if you're rich, you can invest in these things. But it, uh, to be fair, they don't, the, those funds that are in there, they're not subject to, we'll, we'll get into 1940 Act, 1933 Act, they're not subject to all the stuff that Gary Gensler wants so Bitcoin and crypto and these crypto exchanges to be subject to, right? There's a lot of disclosure and agreements. So the hedge funds kind of operate and they're not allowed to market, they're not allowed to do these things. Um, but that's the way GBTC was initially launched. So, so first it launches that, it's just a private trust. I actually added it to the Bloomberg terminal uh, when it launched as a, as a hedge fund. Um, so basically, I, I say hedge fund. It was always a grantor trust, but I'm just referring to it as that because it, you had to have a private placement. It's called like the the document for it was called. It's called a PPM, private placement memorandum. So you invest in that. That's how you go in. You have to be an ARQP. For the most part, people were hand delivering them Bitcoin and getting shares of GBTC in return. Um, and then they listed it on um, the OTC, the over the counter markets, under Rule 144. So basically, that's when GBTC started trading. And it was trading at a couple hundred percent premium, a hundred some odd percent premium. And the way it worked initially, which people in your podcast have gotten into, you put in, say, I give them 10 Bitcoin, I get the equivalent amount of GBTC back, and I'm locked up for 12 months, right? So I, I'm, I sit there for 12 months, I'm locked up, I can't do anything. And I, after 12 months, then I get my shares to my brokerage account and I can do what I want with them. I can hold them, I can sell them. But if you were handing in 10 Bitcoin and you waited 12 months, and then Bitcoin has gone up and GBTC is trading at 120% premium, 100% premium. So if Bitcoin's $10,000, you're selling your GBTC at an equivalent of $20,000 back in 2017 or 2016 before like anything really crazy happened. So that's what people were doing. So a lot of the demand came from people handing, GBT, handing Bitcoin over, getting GBTC shares and trying to take advantage of that premium, right? So they were going in and, and what... What I think David Bailey kind of missed is like I work at Bloomberg, so all of the most of our clients are high high net worth or work in institutions or they deal with this stuff. The people I talked to that were doing this, it was a lot of PE funds, a lot of hedge funds. Like they saw that premium and they were like, I'm gonna arbit. So people went in there, they put in billions of dollars. Like I know a lot of clients who were doing this and like they don't care about Bitcoin. They don't care about crypto. They saw this ARB opportunity and they were pouring money in. And it, honestly, it was at the disadvantage of retail investors because the only way a retail investor could get access to GBTC was buying it on the exchange at that 100% premium, 70% premium, whatever, whatever it was. You had to buy it at a premium. So people who were accredited investors, institutions, were able to put, put their Bitcoin in a lot of them then shorted Bitcoin in the futures market or whatever whatever avenue they had. So they were basically only long that premium. So all of a sudden, once their shares unlocked, they get out of the short, they buy Bitcoin, and then they sell GBTC. So Great trade. Yeah. So people made a ton of money until it unwound. And in ETHE, which I know isn't what we're here to talk about, but that was a perfect example. The, the one step I did miss is these products become SEC reporting companies. J Grayscale did this on purpose because, and also from the get-go, since I started covering them, their goal was, their stated goal was to launch crypto, Bitcoin ETFs. Like that's what they wanted to do. Like from the very get-go, this was the process. And the reason they launched it as a grantor trust, so I talk about those gold ETFs, all those gold ETFs, their underlying structure, the legal structure behind them, they're also grantor trust. It's not just like a misconception that they launched these things as grantor trust. They launched them because it's a tried and true accepted measure to have an underlying structure of grantor trust to launch an ETF that holds some physical assets. And I'm putting physical in quotes for those just listening on audio. Okay, fine. Do you think any of this is the reason why the Bitcoin price ended up becoming correlated so much with traditional markets? Um. 
that's a complex question. I, I part of it maybe I think more it's I'm 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 in agreement with the mostly consensus that a lot of people that were buying Bitcoin were also huge tech investors or in the tech world. Um, so like a lot of the correlation was really to the tech area. Like if you look at the Dow, which holds a lot of industrial type stuff, like the correlation isn't as strong. And also the correlation is broke down. Also like in markets where there's tons of money printing, like any assets, risk assets, which I know you most people in the Bitcoin world don't consider Bitcoin a risk asset, but in the, well. Of course it fucking is. Okay, it's a risk asset. So when it's risk on, all risk as on assets tend to go up at the same time. Yeah, I mean, look, the people who are saying it's not a risk asset are talking narrative because they say, well, the dollar's a risk, but it's, it's a risk asset. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like one Bitcoin is always one Bitcoin, but it, it yeah, it trades like a risk asset for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I did want to talk about ETHG for yeah, a good example. That? So that's, Grayscale's Ethereum one, which okay. shitcoin, if you want to call it that. We right. Do. So I wrote about this. So, like, w when you become an SEC reporting company, you can lower that 12 month lockup to six month lockup. And ETHG was a mess. So, in December of 2020, I wrote about. So, basically, what happened is everyone's creating shares and I can see the flows, I can see the shares increasing on a daily basis for these products. I know what's happening. What happened is when ETHG became an SEC reporting company, they filed, the SEC allowed it. And then there's this time period where everyone who had filed from six months ago to 12 months ago, all that became unlocked at the same time. So like if you look at ETHE and the Ethereum price, and I'm convinced of this, I wrote a note, I, you, I can pull up my, my Twitter thread, basically saying like, this is a massive unlocking of ETH shares and it's going to send the premium, which was around 100% of ETHE, down cratering and like, I can't tell you how many, any time, even back in 2017, when I was tweeting about GBTC, how the premium was going to collapse, FUD, don't know what you're talking about, suit, all these things. And I'm like, just know what you're investing in. Like this thing is trading at a massive premium and people would comment and they'd be like, it's only going to go up. We're going to see a 300% premium here. Um, but yeah, ETHE back in December, 2020, basically what happened is it changed from 12 month lockup to six month lockup. So anyone beyond who created shares before six months ago at that time got their shares like on the same day. And what happened is all those people, so I actually had clients who read my report and were like, oh God, I got to get my shares out. And they got lucky because they were short Ethereum and long ETHE because it was 100% premium because that was the arb trade. It wasn't just the GPTC one, that was the biggest. But what happened is everyone was unlocking their short ETH at the same time. So ETH went through the roof. If you look at the price of ETH from into 2020 into, early, into January 2021, I'm convinced that that was the main reason because people were getting out of their short positions, which means you have to buy ETH, and they were getting rid of their, their ETHE. So if you, a lot of people who were on that ARB trade got rocked. I had multiple clients who actually reached out to me and said they saved like a ton of money by getting out after reading my piece because you were the trade went against you in two directions, which is the same thing that happened with GPTC in when GPTC started going into a discount. Right. So what what do you make of the whole GPTC situation? How much can you actually talk about? You can be completely open with your opinions. Or you yeah, limited? I can be. I can be completely open with my opinions. Okay. So you you listened to my interview with uh, Southern Shine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think? Um, ah. Uh, I thought you were a tad harsh, but he also should have admitted that Genesis like screwed up by putting all their money with three arrows and like like they obviously Genesis screwed up. But again, he, his opinion is like I don't deal with them, which obviously he does in some way. Um, but it really wasn't in his purview. Um, and the other thing is like you you know he was the signatory. Yeah. Oh on yeah. The yeah. Loans. Yeah, yeah. 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 So there there's some culpability there, and he should have said he feels bad for like everyone there but like that's as far as i would say i guess i would go but like where do you think i was harsh uh be honest yeah i actually i did i haven't i listened to it when it launched which was a month ago i so, mean i guess i called him a liar yeah so i i so the problem is like i don't know like the, the main thing so with etfs when i cover etfs everything's out in the open it's fully transparent i can see yeah. every document i can see daily holdings i can see shares with this dcg genesis grayscale situation like i don't have we don't i don't have any special information like i don't know exactly what the relationship was i can't see what money was moving i have to wait for the the quarterly filings what have you which we can get into um about what happened but like i i don't know and obviously grayscale everyone should be pissed if you're a i'm a great i i bought gbtc in 
2016, I think, in my IRA, because it was the only way at the time to get access to it. Now I'm not allowed to trade it, like I said, but like I still hold it and I'm not happy with what's going on here. So I'm a little biased, um, maybe not as biased as David Bailey is or biased as Sun and Shine. But I, I said this before we started recording, I, I probably sit somewhere in the middle of the two of them that when you've covered this topic. So what do you think is going to happen with them? And do you believe they genuinely want an ETF? So I do believe they genuinely want an ETF. But do you think they want an ETF but hope it's maybe in two, three years? Maybe. I don't. I, I, so obviously, this is their only, this is where they're getting most of their cash right now, right? I mean, what yeah, is I think it? You should explain that for people that didn't listen to the David Bailey one, why they might not want to be. So look, they, I mean, what, what's in the trust? How much is in there? How much Bitcoin? 600 some odd thousand, over 3% of the supply. Okay. And they're making four. Hundred ish million based on the current price. Uh, no, uh, it's a little, yeah, something like that. I mean, back in, I, I it doesn't yeah, matter, but, but yeah, four, somewhere around there. They're making a lot of money. 400 million is a good revenue line for a company that probably employs not a lot of people. And so 400 million is great. What a great revenue line. Now, if Bitcoin, I mean, we did an interview yesterday with, uh, do you know Rational Root, the carrot on Twitter? No, I don't. Brilliant. Jim, he has these brilliant charts. Uh, so he, he has this one chart. I'm going to try and draw it for you. But basically, you have the issuance. No, th this is your uh, liquid supply of Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have your issuance rate. Okay. So that's that's your that's your sorry. This is your illiquid supply. This is your Bitcoin that people got locked up and stuff. This is your trading supply. And what happens with each halving? Yeah, it goes okay, down. It goes down. Step function, but. But the amount that's actually being held locked up is growing at a slower rate than the issuance. But we hit an inf what was the inflection point, which was last, the last, last halving. halving. Yeah. And so they're kind of growing about the same. But with the next halving, and so what this essentially becomes your S curve. So you get to this point here over the next kind of two halvings where the liquid tradable supply is a lot lower. Yeah. So over the next for eight years, if there's a growing interest in Bitcoin and a growing adoption, an increasing illiquid supply and a shrinking liquid supply, there's only one thing that can happen to the price of Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin goes to 100K, that 400 million a year becomes 1.2 billion. If it goes to 200K, it becomes 2.5 billion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just have to rationally ask. If you look at the money they would make in the ETF versus what they make in the trust, where are they going to make most of the money? So, sure, maybe they want an ETF, but at the moment, there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot, yeah. of, there's, there's billions of reasons why they don't want it to happen. So, th there's a few things I would say. One, my biggest criticism for them is I thought they should have lowered the fee. Once, of once you get to economy of scale, I think they should have lowered the fee. The, that said, no, no court is going to make them lower the fee. Like if you look over in Europe, the first ETNs are still trading. They charge two and a half percent. There's a bunch of ETFs that charge two percent. Like they're not like it's not like they're all, off out of left field. That said, there are Bitcoin futures ETFs in the U.S. that are trading seventy nine basis points and lower. Basis points is point uh, zero one percent basically, so less than one percent fee. Um, but fees add up over time. Like they really eat into your return. Um, but obviously, they're they're saying they're using it. Their their defenses are going to use it to fight the SEC, and they really are fighting the SEC. And I'm, uh, I think they're going to win their lawsuit um, against the SEC for an APA violation. Okay, let's get into that. So what's an APA violation? So basically, it says um, Administrative Procedures Act, and basically, it says any any uh, government entity, regulator, whatever, has to treat like situations alike. I'm dumbing it down, but it like. Bitcoin futures ETFs, spot Bitcoin ETFs. And basically, Grayscale's argument is you're allowing Bitcoin futures ETFs, but your reasoning makes no sense. Like you can't, you can't do one without the other, which I I've been saying since they've been denying spot and approving futures because like the futures market and the spot market are inextricably linked. Like they go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Anyone who knows anything about derivatives markets knows that's how it works. So the idea that like you can manipulate spot and it wouldn't affect futures or vice versa, like is just insane to me. So I, we saw the, I listened to the hearing. We thought that they had one judge in their hands, Grayscale, I'm saying. So I have, we have a, I have a crew of people I work with on this. So we have people who cover uh, exchange companies that cover crypto. We have people who do what, what I have, whatever on that side. I have people covering uh, cryptos as a commodity. 
Um, I have I have a crypto analyst who covers a lot of the on chain metrics, who's based in Australia, actually. And then I also what we have a litigation analyst who's he used to be a lawyer and he covers this stuff. So he's covered the Ripple lawsuit, he's covering this lawsuit. And initially going in, we were like, all right, they got this one judge who's a Democrat leaning and like he's likely going to be on their side. There's this other judge that they could possibly get and this third judge that there's probably no way they're going to get. And listening to the hearing, which you can't you can't base everything off of that. It's just their line of questioning. But like we went from his view was like Grayscale is a 40% chance, which everyone I was talking to was like, this is a frivolous lawsuit. It's going to get thrown out. Grayscale has a powerhouse litigation team behind them filing this lawsuit. This is not like some like nobody doing this, right? Which I think he mentioned on his, his podcast. But how brave he was. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that was a little strong. But I, 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 suing your regulator is a big step. Like, you gotta, like, they are an asset manager. They have to deal with the SEC no matter what they do going forward. So going out and suing them in federal court is definitely like there's a give and take that usually happens with these regulators. So like going out and suing them in federal court isn't like the most the smartest business move, but they're kind of out of moves in my opinion. Uh, I forgot where I was going with that. The judges. Oh, the judges. So – we listened to it, and then the second judge came in, and it was just hammering the SEC lawyer. Like, and we were like, "Okay, well, they got two. They might. They're probably going to win this now." Like within like the first fifteen minutes, I was live tweeting it. Actually, I was like, "This is crazy." Is the three judges total? It's three. It's a three judge panel, and then the third judge came in, and that we thought was no shot. Started asking hard questions of the SEC that like were in line with our thinking. So we we're like, "Okay." The downside is, so my our base case, so he's flipped from 40% chance Grace go in to 70% chance of Grace go in after that or the oral arguments, as they're called, which we should get sometime. It could happen before June, the end of June, but likely 2Q, 3Q, and we should get the Ripple case, which is irrelevant to you. Blech. But yeah, I'm 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 I kind of view them as view it as a security. But I, at this point, I just anyone any wins against the SEC, I'm I'm all for. Oh, listen, <laughs> I can I can hate Ripple and XRP and want them to beat the SEC at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's where I sit Fuck right now the for the most part. Um, Apart from Hester Purse, we like Hester. Yeah, yeah, Hester's great. Yeah, She is awesome. Um, it, it's really Gary. It's mo it's mostly Gary Gensler, to be very clear. Yeah, I want Hester to get Gary's job. Yeah. Um, but and, but so now it's like we, we think 70% chance. The problem here is that the SEC, I mean, not the SEC, the judges might issue a ruling that says like, you violated the APA. Like you did not treat like situations alike and then say, go back to the drawing board. And then the SEC could then just deny for other reasons, right? Which I think is my base case of what's likely going to happen. So Grayscale might win the case and then still not be able to convert to an ETF. 